Hi guys, welcome to another sneak peek. This time with the Heavenly Realms book Wayfarers by Jonathan Goss. Just released on Audible. I'll see you at the end. Melfax had always said that God was not impressed by the clever schemes of crooked hearted fools. That is put sharply into contrast when the King of Sodom arrives on the outskirts of Salem. He will not venture into the Vale for whatever reason. Our principal sees this, and seeking to preserve the sanctity of this place, makes his overtures of departure. But not before our troop is given time to wash the stink from our uniforms, clean our armour, sharpen our arms and bathe in the waters of the valley's crystal streams. We patch up our wounded and secure our dead for the transport back home. Those who can fight while on medical profile stay. I'm grateful for every spear and synapse. Having squared ourselves away, we dwell in Salem. It is a tremendous respite. It is lovely. After a time, Melchizedek and Abraham part ways. I muster our forces. Truth be told, we don't want to leave. No one says as much, but you can feel it in their movements. There is a serenity to this fail. Abraham meets the king of Sodom in the hill country to the south. We are less than impressed. He rides upon a chariot and has a retinue of cavalry with him. He is resplendent in what is left of his royal garb. Most of his jewellery, gilded trinkets and baubles are in the packs that Abraham's war chiefs carry. This is apparent to us. It is lost on him. They greet each other with formal salutations at a respectful distance. There is no love lost between the two. Abraham's dress is functional and subdued, that of a warrior king fresh from a miraculous victory. He dwells with the Lord, of that much I know. Therefore his attire is earth tones and leather armour caked in dust and blood. He bears a red stained linen bandage on his left bicep, and the strain of warfare at his age has given him a noticeable limp. He smells of sweat, and the sour dank musk of warfare's fluidic purchase. His posture is one of a lion fresh off the kill. His senses are still heightened, even after his sojourn in Salem. By contrast, the king of Sodom reeks of perfume. His beard is coiled with wax and tied with dyed purple cords. His armour is ceremonial. It jingles when he snaps his reins. His attendants rush to his every need and catch the dung from his chariot's horse with silk sacks, cinched by gilded rope. The king of Sodom labours to remain erect and poised. I'd wager this is the most he has stood since he pointed the way to his army's doom at the Battle of Sidom. Lord Abram, the king of Sodom begins, his flaky tenor a thing of nausea. Truly, are you of the gods? What libation of burnt offering must I make to attain this magical victory you have achieved? By what star do you lead this flock of demigods and mighty men? Point to it, that I might sacrifice a hundred bulls in its honour. I will flood the world with the blood of all sacrifices to attain such knowledge. For not since the day of Titans have we seen such victory claimed by a single man. I owe all my victory to the one true God, the Lord of heavens and earth, who has blessed the hands of my allies to achieve justice over their captors. Abraham's voice carries like a bell in the summer breeze. The ginger twins smell the breeze when he speaks. Ah, I see, the king of Sodom says his nose lifting. A powerful magic your god commands. Tell me, was this the same god who brought cataclysm upon the earth by breaking the firmament and waters of the deep? Abraham affirms him with a countenance lifted to heaven. He is the lord of my forefathers, who kept his way true for them in the face of temptation. And what then should I do to attain this power? The king of Sodom asks nervously fingering the rim of his chariot. Should the world flood again, I would have one to be prepared. Abram shakes his head. The Lord has promised to never deluge the earth again. You have no need to fear that kind of wrath, King of Sodom. Ah, but to God's oaths are fickle, Lord Abram. We all have seen the way they tinker and toy with us, playthings for princelings. 
Not my God, King of Sodom, Abraham says with a firm tone and eyes are fixed on his rival. Alas, you might be right, the king admits. After all, I commanded a great host led from a mighty city and you turned away our conquerors with little more than a war band. They are devoured by buzzards beyond the king's veil. My squires outnumber your force, he laughs at that. We do not like his tone. Name your price then for the secret of this power, Lord Abram, and we shall part as friends always. Abram tells him that he cannot, for it is not his power to command. The king of Sodom tries again and again, Abram refuses him. The king puffs his chest and lowers his chin, brows turned heavy. Then by the code of our empire, to which we are still slaves, you may keep the spoils of your victory, return to me the people of my city, lest I bereft of bodies to fetch revenue for our punitive taxes. Abram's reply is swift and assured. I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latch, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich, save on that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Maimra. Let them take their portion. We draw up and I feel my grip tighten on my lance half. My eyes grow sharp as I eye the retinue around the Sodomite king. Men shift on their sandals and attention arises. In the distance on the far outskirts, I can hear the calls of our forsaken brethren as they feel the emotional energy of the moment rise like a swell from the sea. The king entreats this proclamation with a gut-busting laugh. Verily, Lord Abram, I cannot recover the food your men have eaten to fuel their fighting flesh, nor can I take back the wine that they have drank to celebrate their wounds, nor the whetstones and articles of kit that helped you achieve your momentous victory. They may take their spoils per the laws of this land, and you may have your people. He leans forward with a wink and a sly grin. We of the angelic host feel it coming as he wriggles a callous free finger at our principal. But should your people ever wish to return to our glorious metropolis, Sodom will welcome them with open arms. Lovers of Sodom are loved in return. Your tribe will always have a pillow in my parlour. He winks a lot. Behind him, far off in the distance, I can see the flicker of fallen eyes as they watch us from the tree line beyond the ravines and lowlands, like packs of coyotes waiting for their prey to make a mistake. I'm sure Jihad is out there, likely with Baal in tow. We're going to have a real fight on our hands soon. Our principal takes a deep breath and closes his eyes. I hear his prayers delicate as a songbird on the serenading summer wind. He then bows once more to the king of Sodom and doles out commands to his wagon train. His followers unlash the gold, ornaments and plunder, the food and wine and recovered gear, then turn around and make their way humbly back to Abram's home. We watch him leave impressed by his holy resolve as well as his stoic constitution. I am endeared to the man. He is upright before the Lord, as the humans are wont to express. We would call him Halo-worthy, if only we had angels of his calibre in the numbers before the First War. There may never have been a First War. On our way back to Abram's dwelling place, my messengers catch up with us. He circles above our formation, letting me see him. I flag him down to my position. He descends and glides next to me as we saw over Abram's train. The scroll is delivered into my hand with a wide-eyed caution. It reads, his lineage bears the mantle. Hold fast the way, maintain the protocols. It is not an easy thing I ask of you, Gabriel. I crumble the paper in my fist and shove it into my journey pack at my hip. My face grows hot, and it takes everything I have not to fly up to the lower realm with all haste and give someone a vicious ear beating. This is a serious misappropriation of resources, we are an interdiction and quick strike force. We are not a field legion. We are force multipliers, irregular warfare at best. Reconnaissance in force at most, not a line company. 
That is a massive difference that could get us all killed if the higher-ups don't recognise that. And of course, Raziel is nowhere in sight to augment our minuscule strength. Either things are worse than I thought or the crowns in Zion are scratching their dandruff. I can only hope that Melfax is on the case. At least we've been resupplied. Our paper strength is just over 2700. Our actual fighting strength is closer to 2500. A revamp our cause, instead of two brigades consisting of two regiments of 750 angels each, I reform our task force into two brigades and a first cohort. First brigade will still have first and second regiments, second brigade will still have third and fourth regiments, but they are cut down to smaller units of 500 angels each, with the remainder being placed in a spearhead of quick reaction force regiment, simply called first cohort. I put Captains Willie and Abacus in charge of the 1st and 2nd Brigade respectively, with acting field promotions to Lieutenant Commander for each of them. The pipeline up the chain hasn't been broken here. We lost a lot of our command staff reaching Salem. I need to refit and reorganise with angels I can trust. Those two proved themselves. It's the least I could do for the Corps. The Sergeant Major doesn't seem to mind. Hell, he's just relieved I didn't put him in that position. He assures me he will make every effort to keep the lads in check, should they have piss stains over it. First Cohort is mine to command, under the more specific and official title of 5th Regiment. Its purpose is to be more of a mobile reinforcement unit or diversionary spearhead than anything else. I'm hoping breaking us up into smaller units will make us more manoeuvrable, especially given this arid terrain. Larger legions, such as a campaign legion or even standard legions, can stand to have larger blocks of troops where the average cohort is, say, 800 to 1,000 angels. But everything must be to scale in order to accommodate manoeuvre warfare. Thus my units must be smaller in order to retain maximum flexibility on the field. We will need to be able to redeploy at the drop of a pinhead to respond to crisis. Subject to the needs of the service, as the saying goes, and even then it still may not be enough to get the job done. And still, I know Jihad Althazil and his army of fallen trail our wake. We hear their whispers on the summer winds when we bivouac at night. We smell their musket dawn when we strike camp in preparation to follow Abram's people on the way back to their home. They are an evanescent haunt at our napes and flanks. Yet the rules of engagement dictate that we must stay within the warding proximity of our human charges. Countless times are we taunted by sorties, only to be forced to disengage in order to catch up to the main van. These scant few warbands are little more than annoyances, but they persist day and night. And we know that they use them to keep tabs on us. Althazil has not made any major moves yet, but I know it's coming. Then it dawns on me. They don't know Raziel is not with us. The fear of his celebrity keeps them at bay, and if they don't know, Dion probably doesn't know either. I'm preparing to draft another missive requesting reinforcements to Gabriel or Melfax, or anyone who will listen, when I suddenly become keenly aware of how close on the heels of Raziel's departure my messenger returned to us. They probably passed each other as ships in the ethereal night, even if Raziel was fast enough to reach Zion before my Seraph left, no normal angel moves that fast. He would have been on the winds for at least a day. They don't know. They think Raziel is still with us, instead of gallivanting off doing God knows what. This is a problem. We are marching on borrowed time. I toy with figuring out a way to make it appear as if Raziel is still with us but one might as well chase shadows on the sun or juggle water. I suddenly recall Melfax's words in the locker room before our step off, when he told me that I had the con on this one. At first I was peevishly resentful of Raziel's command presence in light of what I was told. Melfax was consciously or inadvertently preparing me for this. In retrospect, I wouldn't mind having Raziel on site to take the heat. Weeks drag on into months. Months encroach upon a year. We constantly patrol Abram's territory, grateful that he is the kind of ruler that seeks to neither expand his territory or sell it off. 
this makes establishing pickets with our already thinly stretched lines easier to maintain given that we are tasked with escorting humans and they don't exactly like to move much at night. We survey the scene constantly, cognizant of Althazeel's forces waiting in the wings as well as the ever-present threat of Baal. Althazeel threatens us directly, Baal threatens us tangentially by his influence on the humans. I still cannot determine his identity despite every self-proclaimed king in the region worshipping him. I begin sending persistent, consistent inquiries along my field reports asking about this. Always the answer is the same. Maintain the protocols. Guard the way. That sounds like Michael's tongue. My Archon would be far less tight-lipped as to what exactly these protocols are. I can only surmise that he's referring to our Broken Wings initiative training. Little did I know what he actually had in mind. Willie and Abacus do an excellent job of coordinating our resupply drops. Not that it's all that difficult. Abraham does not travel far, given the apostate kings to the south and the technological powerhouse that is the plain of Shinar to the north. The remnants of the Tower of Babel are in the perpetual employ of the Shinaran king, who really acts as more of a steward than anything, while Emperor Nimrod gallivants around the continent, making a name for himself in his dance with the devilish principalities and demonic satraps. We are mercifully spared this cosmic drama. Instead, we witness something better. It is no mean secret that Abram dwells with our father. On occasion, we even see the sun visit him escorted by two halos, none other than Arcadia and Raziel. We bear witness to the formation of the Covenant and its subsequent generations. We celebrate the birth of Abraham. We watch him try to number the stars and then marvel many years later at how he spends far more time playfully counting his newborn son's piggies. But not before the sun entreats with Abraham in a way that stands our hairs on end. They dwell under a tree and share a meal with the patriarch. It's charming to watch Raziel deal with human food. That dandy is a bit spoiled. Yet the point of the visit is clear. Sodom and Gomorrah are to be destroyed. There is a bit of bargaining back and forth for Lot's sake. But, in the end, the angel of the Lord stays with Abraham while Arcadia and Raziel descend into Sodom to do their brimstone business. The light show is spectacular. We watch from the cloudy cope as Raziel rains imperial fire down upon the wicked cities, Arcadia hastening Lot's ridiculous family from the scene. What a ponce! But then again, birds of a feather. Always, Jihad Althazeel seeks to befoul these unions and always we repel his sorties, zooming in fast and low to smash his invading contingents to kindling. The Fallen never shows himself, but we feel his presence in every fight. They are probing us. The birth of Isaac is a tremendous thing. We dance that night, for a time I forgot that it's been years since we have seen Zion. Either we have become injured to the mundanity of this creation realm, or it is starting to grow on us. For some reason we are able to relax despite our circumstances. There is a strange comfort that all our hope and salvation lies in the descendants of this little life before us. On that day, we receive another communique. What would we be without our faith, Elthaliel? What would they be without the path to their salvation? Guard the way! Well, I smiled then. Now I smile at how unprepared we were. Raziel is a two-edged sword, Abacus states that same night, around the battle map in the centre of our command pavilion. Yeah, says Willie, he scared them right off with turning the Sodomites into a bunch of flaming crickets. Even bought us time to prep. But here we are, cats out of the bag. They know he was never with us now. I bet old Althazel's going to want to make up for lost time. Vengeance for pulling the wool over his big bad wolf eyes. Willie's candour carries weight. We must tread lightly. I put us on high alert. It couldn't come at a better time. The next year, Abraham and his wife Sarah are blessed with a son. He's a good lad. 
His name means he will laugh, and we find that much like the angels, humans tend to fulfill the prophecy of their names. The demons howled at the moon the night he was born. We hear the fallen growl in the shadows. We expected an attack, but Althazeel knew how to play the game. Abraham's region is dominated by Mount Moriah. Salem lies to the south, with Hinnom Valley abutting their border. I know that the Fallen will not attack from there. To the west lies the Tyropean Valley. I put 1st Brigade there to set traps and watch the flank. To the east is the Kidron Valley. Abacus has command of the 2nd Brigade there, and to the north with my 1st Cohort in support, knowing that the Shinar Valley is a hotbed of Fallen activity. It's a good perimeter, with each regiment tenaciously creating ambuscades and choke points. But things are quiet for a very, very long time, and I grow concerned that we are getting soft in our lackadaisical night watch. Some years later, Abraham takes him up Mount Moriah. They are headed for the altar. By then, we are reinforced back up to paper strength. I detail off all 500 angels as a supplemental force under the sigil of 1st Cohort, dubbing them 5th Group and retaining them as evasive force multipliers. They are to be our detachment of irregulars committed to unconventional warfare. Even within our core of clandestine elites, they are to be even more off the books. I need plausible deniability should they be captured. We establish protocol that anyone admitted into 5th Group either by nomination or volunteering have their bodies burned if slain. I cannot risk the enemy finding out about them, one way or another. Not everyone agrees with this. Willie finds it borderline sacrilegious and Abacus campaigns against it, citing that such harsh measures will fracture our spirit de corps. Times change, Lieutenant Commanders, I tell them. The theatre of this war has changed at least for us. If we don't hold the line here and protect our reputation, this way that Zion keeps talking about will be lost. I want the enemy complacent in their assumption of our character. Until heaven commits more force, we must improvise. I put the Obsidian Twins Muriel and Moriel in charge of 5th Group, nicknamed the Dreadlocks for their manes of twisted braids draping their short, fit coal-coloured frames past their wing slits. Two of the 500 replacements are fast with a smile and a plan. I know they can operate independent of my command should things go awry. They immediately get to work augmenting our traps. The day of Abraham and Isaac's ascent up Mount Moriah, Althazeel launches his assault. I am holding the watch observing the sunset. The overcast sky is a blanket of fiery orange and rose with Mount Moriah dominating the landscape vista before me. It's beautiful. I am knocked from my trance by the sound of unspooling cords, torsion guns ripping their fusillades through the air, and plumes of fire echoing the crepuscular onset of night. Chaos arises on all fronts. The air tears with the perforation of arrow volleys. It whistles with the arc of javelins and screams with the hurling of slinger stones. This is good. It tells me that the enemy is not on us. We still have time. I turn to Willie. Lieutenant Commander Longhorn, redeploy your regiment further back towards the mountain. Give ground to the enemy so your angels will have space to expend their ammunition. Abacus stands beside me, arms behind his back, his face a blank stare. I know the calculations he is running in his mind. Transit your regiment's lottery, Lieutenant Commander. I want a clockwise rotation around the north half of the mountain every 10 minutes. Make them think our numbers are greater than they are. And before you ask, yes, I am requesting reinforcements from Zion. Captains Muriel and Moriel are harder to track down. I send a message to the dreadlock stating that first cohort will remain in inner perimeter moving counterclockwise, reinforcing as needed. The first wave is demonic. We know this judging by the multitude of ground traps that are sprung. The second wave is airborne, fallen. I don't think they were expecting us to be in the clouds. The very nature of our legion puts us in hiding on terra firma or concealed in atmosphere. Again, we are not a campaign legion or a line company. We operate in extremes. 
the airborne renegades are silhouetted against the moonlit clouds. They do not blow horns or trumpets like Baal's forces, instead they screech and scream and wail like banshees from the underworld or a child's nightmarish bedtime story. Mount Moriah is a series of peaks and shelves rising up out of the terrain, creating three separate valleys. We had hoped to trap many of the enemy in the defiles since they preferred to sneak on the ground. However, in response to Althazeel's fallen, I find myself sweeping into the long, shallow arcs with the sentries of First Cohort arranged in winged echelons and vanguards. Fifth Group responds to them before we do with darts and slinger stones from the ground. They create a veritable flak field in the air that fells more than one apostate brother. We see their dark forms tumble, blood trailing behind them as they cartwheel to the earth. I charge first cohort in behind the lead element of winged attackers. The air rushes past us in deafening roar as we swoop in and begin unloading darts and slinger bullets. Some of the angels in the second echelon manage to get closer and hurl javelins as we chase them. The fallen are moving fast for the mountain. Most of them don't even bother to turn and duel with us. The ground races underneath us. Our tunics flutter furiously as we speed through the air. I angle up behind a fallen racing through the sky and begin hurling my clutch of darts at his back. To miss, I have never been very good with these things. The third manages to catch him in a high arc down into his backplate, right between the wing slits. I hear the crack of his metal armour and he pinwheels to the ground, spraying blood and screaming at the night sky as he plummets to the ground. Several more descend in a flying wing and begin loosing javelins at me. I see their murderous shafts whistle past my ears. I take evasive action banking high and left and cutting my speed as I hug the upslope of the mountain. If I can get behind them, I may have a chance at evening the odds. Their screeching precedes them and my skin crawls with dread as another volley of javelins comes in. I barrel roll in an aerial manoeuvre that narrowly twists my armoured winged form around two slender shafts which manage to take chunks of my fluttering tunic. My angelic flesh tingles and brims with a fearful self-preservation, yet I must press through the urge to flee if I am to survive. I arc back into the night sky and dive for the hard deck some 20 metres above the surface of the valley. Though my halo is concealed by my helmet, it certainly doesn't do me any favours in my stealth, giving off a slight afterglow. Yet still, I am able to get behind the flight of fallen hunters. I see their chainmail hawbricks fluttering under their flapping wings, painted black and reeking of that iron, rusting smell of craw. I try not to gag as I gig another with my remaining darts. Spent of ammunition, I unsheath my sabre and swing my shield around, getting ready for the close-in work. My spear I position on my back per the protocols, its warhead protruding forward, few cubits to be used as an aerial ram of sorts. If I can get the jump on the enemy. Two more of the felonous brethren are felled by volleys from below, and I look down to see the winking eyes of fifth group. The fallen continue on only to be intercepted by Moriel's unit of irregulars hidden in the scrub below. I'll give the fallen this, they stay on task even to the point of death. That is an admirable form of zealotry, if not one that is perverted by Satan. I light onto a rocky jut on the left side of Mount Moriah and look out in time to see Abacus's 2nd Brigade get bogged down on the sister mountain across the ravine to our west. They land on the summit just long enough to assemble a waiting anti-personnel battery of porcupine and ghoul guns. They get off a brace of volleys before being swarmed by demons, scrambling up the rocky, shrub-infested slope. Again, per the protocols, Abacus pulls back his cohort in flight, leaving a detail of two angels at the battery, one to sabotage it and another to guard him. For a moment, I lose sight of them, until the apparity explode their detonation taking scores of black souls with them. The war engines erupt in a plume of fiery debris, and I stand agape as the ravine between us lights in an orange glow, reveal a host of demons scurrying across the terrain like a shifting carpet of chittering scarabs. I turn to First Brigade's angels. Willie! I bark over the fighting. Swarm in the ravine! Roger that, boss! 
he shouts back before turning to his cohort. Boys, the Beatles on the hard deck, smoke them if you've got them. They take off with projectile weapons in hand, producing handheld fire pots and all manner of shrapnel throwing devices. But they are overworked as it is. I worry that my gamble has not paid off. In my attempt to cover ground and confuse the enemy, I have had my two brigades rotating their positions clockwise around Mount Moriah. This plan works, assuming no cohorts are cut off and no angels buckle and rout. The Centurions do their part, keeping morale in check and hardening the hearts of their units. But all it takes is one break in the line, one link to snap, for the whole chain to come undone. Above me, the aerial assault continues unabated even as my first cohort launches sorties down through the fallen ranks. Flights of the enemy are cut to ribbons as my guardians of the way rip through them with everything they have before resorting to their melee weapons. And even then, the fallen continue their race for the summit. I chase after the survivors, fearful of what awaits me at the top. Up the mountain I climb, hopscotching on wings when I can and mantling up with hands and feet when I must. I look up and to the right, espying movement on the wending goat track leading to the summit and balk. Abraham and Isaac are making their way to the top, bundles of kindling and the necessary implements for sacrifice in hand. My bowels turn to ice as my eyes trace a path to the summit where an ancient stone altar is situated. I follow in his footsteps, landing on the goat track it is then that I realise the focal point of this fallen assault. I begin shouting for the first cohort to form up on me. We must fight our way to the summit to secure the altar. Willie and the Obsidian Twins can handle the demonic upswell. Abacus is busy securing the airspace over the westernmost mountain, cutting off Althazeel's fallen from reinforcing their echelons. We must protect the principle. My angels begin flying for the top, only to be met with wave after wave of airborne fallen winging through the night, offloading massive payloads of fire pots, slinger stones and javelins. Several of my fast movers are dropped from their squadrons by these volleys, crashing to the hard scrabble mountain terrain, clutching lethal, barbarous wounds. I wave them down. We are cut off and we are losing precious time. I see several more of my apostate brothers dart to the summit disappearing over the scrub edge of the uppermost shelf. There is no time for fancy strategy. I will simply have to brute force my way through. I sheathe my sword and withdraw my spear. A score of other faithful join me on the goat track and we form the best assault wedge that we can. I give the order and we push up the slope, moving as swiftly on foot as possible, while firebrands and murderous arrows scream past us in sizzling flight. We hear them ricochet off our round shields. Some find lucky marks in the helmets or unguarded calves of my angels. We do not have time to triage them. All I can do is allow their constellation partners to peel off and extract them, defend them or die with them. We must press on. The principal is vulnerable. Althazeel's fallen cannot be allowed to rendezvous with him. We meet a rabble of rebels who have collected on the bend of the goat track meandering on the shoulder of the mountain at a dusty clearing. They are reforming and checking their gear. We fall upon them with a vicious temerity. Their blunder is our boon. We have caught them flat-footed. They put up a heroic defence, but we slaughter them to the last. It is not my intention to drive off Althazeel's fallen. I know that in order to protect Abraham and preserve the way, Jihad's army must be destroyed in detail. As such, his demonic thralls are putting our ingenuity to the test. I hear the chaos below and feel the heat of a thousand breaths expiring simultaneously several times over as fifth group wreaks their havoc on the army of disembodied spirits in the ravine. Hundreds die their second death at the hands of Moriel and Muriel's subterfuge. They are masters of traps and ambuscades and it feels good to turn the tables on the armies of the dragon for once. But that is a distraction. We reach the summit. Another pocket of fallen resists us, this time prepared for our encroachment. They are barely more than a dozen, situated with their backs to the mountainside and their war spears bristling forward over the rims of their kite shields. 
We hear the domino-like cascade of heavy slapping metal as they lap their shields, forming like a thin line of scales against us. I cannot blame them. We all learn from the same weapons master, but I cannot forgive them either. We press on their ranks and skewer them in an orderly array of overlapping assaults. One echelon comes in and thrusts their spears at the fallen for several seconds. Then another joins them for a trice before the first withdraws. This happens several times over as the 40 some odd angels under my immediate control chew down the fallen formation. It works, taking less than a minute but that's still precious time. We are risking much. We are within hailing distance of the summit in time to see a significant force marshal around the bend at the last bit of track. They stand and face us, thirteen across and six deep, snarling and braying their fangs at us. Their faces are painted red, and they screech and howl at us like lunatics. They raise their spears in unison into the night, and from their columns spews forth several fire pots, bursting on the dirt path before them and creating a fiery edge. We cannot go over them. The missile fire is too great. We can't go around them. We must go through them. I scan the scene for options. Movement catches my eye on the final utmost cliff face and I see a single fallen scramble over the lip of the summit. I recognize that gate. Jihad Althazil. The angels around me witness it too. Get to him, Commander, one of the Centurions tells me. We'll deal with this lot. I consider our numbers and survey the advantageous position of the enemy before us. With their fire trap and numerical superiority, I see the sacrificial nobility of this. I will mourn my angels later. The guilt and tug of grief are Ceylons afforded to those who dwell in the aftermath. The present cannot reckon itself with heartbreak. I don't remember my last words to them. I suppose it doesn't matter. They rest in the Empyrean now. Lucky fools. My brothers can be sometimes. I sling my spear and shield and climb up the same portion of cliff face that I saw Althazil surmount, taking a concealed shortcut that will cut off anyone on the goat track, namely Abraham. Can they kill him? Is that their intent? I have failed as an officer in charge to divine the enemy's intentions. Like I said, I never wanted command. The smoke of battle is causing me to spit and my eyes to burn by the time I clamber over the tangle of roots, rock and dirt. I pull my way up to the summit to behold the altar. Isaac is helping Abraham set up the firewood, kindling and fire starter. Althazil stands before them. Watching with his broadsword resting on his shoulder, he sees my movement and catches my eye. Althaliel, he says indignantly. I thought they'd at least put that little jade-eyed Prince Raziel in charge of the smashing. He throws his bald head back and crows into the night before pointing his sword at me and leaping down from the altar. He crouches and lurks around the stone edifice like a predatory cat, seizing me up for the first time in millennia. Oh well, he sighs sheathing his sword. It's been a while since I got to play with my food. Althazil lunges for me, clawed hands outstretched. I try to intercept him with my spear, but he's too quick and evades my iron warhead, jerking to my right and wrapping his powerful arms around the haft. In a blink, he snaps the Cornell spear haft in two and spins inboard towards me, bringing the spearhead in on my unshielded right. I barely deflect with the reinforced rim of my steel round shield, the blade still managing to slice my shoulder. Althazil is fast and snarling at me when we collide. He grabs me in ways that neutralize my ability to respond and resist and we go tumbling over the cliff edge. We land on my back with a thud, the wind leaving my lungs as his weight presses down on me. I try to go for my sabre in its scabbard, but Althazil is prepared and moves his knee into my hip socket. I cry out in pain. He was, after all, the chief weapons master before being tricked by Lucifer into pursuing the Phoenix Empyrean. How am I supposed to outsmart and outfight Michael's chief cherubic instructor? I'll never know. All I can do is hope to survive. Firepots explode around us. My shield provides my only protection, boiling in spots with naphtha. 
More fire comes in closer, and I see Althazil pointed ears catch some of the molten charges in the flush and roar of acidic burning orange flames. He snarls and clutches at the wound as smoke sizzles off us. He rolls off to the side and I scramble clear of him to see Muriel lighting another of the handheld explosives and gleefully preparing to toss it in our direction. I don't run so much as tumble my way clear. Commander! Muriel spits at me as he hurls the pot in Althazil's direction. Find my brother on the goat track! The surviving members of the fifth group start lobbing the firebombs at the space where Althazil was. They only need to keep him distracted. Now without my spear, I draw my saber from its scabbard, pluck my shield from the dirt and race back up the track. I'm alone. Demons and the occasional fallen try to intercept me, but my training in the smoke column earn its soup in my preserved blood. I manage to dash through them, making short work of the felonous assault. Many are knocked off the path by my shield. A few are slain by my sword. All that matters to me is reaching the altar. My lungs burn and swear flings off of me. My ears thunder and the hammer of a thundering pulse and every muscle seems to cramp and spasm. I push myself on, adrenaline alone, wide-eyed and desperate to get back. Up, up and up, some more I race, sprinting and huffing and coughing and gasping as I swing wildly at any demon who tries to stop me or slam the full weight of my body into any fallen who descends to challenge me. Near the summit, I see the pile of dead angels and the smouldering bar of fire that separated them. I am tempted to slow down, but I know I can't afford to lose one more second. I am too tired to use my wings, even if I wanted to. The arrow flights and sheets of slinger stones are still saturating the pre-dawn light. From the pile of dead faithful, I see movement spring to life. My heart is relieved to think that some of my halos have survived but alas, I am met with a mix of emotions as Moriel emerges from the charnel pile, bearing something large and dark in his spindly, blood-covered arms. His coal-colored body stands in stark contrast to his white armor. All of it turned red with blood and a desperate look in his eyes. He rushes up to me as I scramble on all fours up the last bit of goat track leading to the altered summit. Tur! Moriel shouts at me. I turn. Take this! He throws his cargo at me and I manage to catch it. Relieved of his burden, Moriel crashes to the earth. I see what remains of his backplate, hacked and maimed to jagged serrations, vomiting blood and tendrils of flesh. How he endured so much, I'll never know. The cargo is a sack weighing some 40 pounds. It's warm and it moves. It's alive. I take this bundle up the last stretch of track to the summit, unsure of why this thing mattered so much to Moriel in what seems like the final moment. As I am drawn upon the altar's location, the pre-dawn light illuminates the mountaintop in fiery strips of rose and orange hues. The dawn is beautiful. I am momentarily arrested by it, then I look at the altar and my trance breaks. Abraham has placed Isaac on the altar. The sack-covered cargo bays in my arms, and I look at Abraham as he draws the ceremonial sacrificial dagger from its doeskin sheath. He holds it overhead, poised above Isaac's bare torso. His son's eyes stare up at him in confusion. Abraham is weeping, his hands trembling, his lips fluttering in tearful prayers. This cannot be. I fail to understand. No! I hear myself shout through the ether. The sack is torn from my hands and out springs its cargo. A lamb. Never before have I thought curly white wool would look so beautiful. It's then that the sky splits. The fire of dawn light is breached by the purer, silver mercury colored shimmering light of the Empyrean. There is a peal of heavenly thunder from a cloudless sky. The fabric of the realm is opened like the stitches of reality split by the master surgeon's scalpel. The voice of the Lord issues forth and speaks to Abraham. It is preceded by the sound and fury of the Council of Zion and the select seraphim acolytes that are chosen to sing around the white throne. This is unprecedented. 
We have not seen a glimmer of the Empyrean since the Battle of a Thousand Peaks. It is arresting to behold. We all, each to an angel, stop what we are doing and drop to our knees. Even the fallen obey. The demonic hordes are scattered as ash before the blaze. Strangely enough, the light of the Empyrean does not shine on Abraham's face. I suspect the humans are not yet ready to behold the unfiltered glory of the Lord our God. He can, however, hear Father's voice. We feel it more than hear it, but clearly Abraham is tuned into God. After all, the angel of the Lord has dwelt with him. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, he says. Neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. From the opening emerges a second voice, born on the hilt of a flaming sword I had not seen in years. Erengard, a familiar baritone says to me, the way has been preserved. Grab your angels and follow us. It's Ural. I can barely detect his gnarly, curly-rimmed bald wink behind the flaming blade. He hovers aloft, Wings outstretched, the various missiles of the enemy turned away by its flashing blade, deflecting and swiping them into shards faster than even my angelic eyes can comprehend. Us? Eshel Dabar, and I knew you had it in you, Ural tells me with an easy tone. Now come, he beckons me with the fiery sword. The dawn skies made safe by the very presence of its holy implementation. We have work to do. Thanks for listening, guys. Like and subscribe if you want to hear more. And I'll see you next time. Bye.